Luke 10, verse 17. We are approaching our last um, st study in the Seeing Straight series. One more after, after this. Um, these two weeks, this week and next week, are going to be the conclusion of it. Really important weeks because these two weeks have to do with joy. And um, so, so joy is a big deal. Um, C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. And I like that. That's a great quote. Joy is the serious business of, of heaven. And so it's important for us to study joy, to know what joy is. Um, and, um, you know, being a joyful person is a great thing. Um, being joyful is not so that I can just be positive. Okay, that's, that's not what it's about. But being joyful because I don't have any choice. I have any choice because of what's going on inside of me is just like so great and it's so powerful and it's so overflowing that it just finds its way out. It's not on purpose, it's just doing it. It's kind of like those old um, Texan oil drills, you know, it was probably 1900s or whatever when they had those early pictures and they would hit oil and all of a sudden what would happen? The geyser would go up, right? And I, I forgot what they would say, you know, but... Um, Probably a bad illustration. It pollutes the environment and all that. We know that now. But, but you know, but, but that kind of joy, you know, like this, this geyser thing that's going out, out of us. Like that's what, that's what, that's what Jesus intended. You know, some people are positive, and that's all good. I, I mean, I like positive people. Some, some people put like an optimistic spin on just about, about everything. Some people, they positively confess things, which I guess is better than negatively confessing things. I get that. You know, I get it. I, I get that. Um, I, I'm not down on that stuff. But what I want to talk about today is not like looking on the sunny side or how do you view the glass as half full and not half empty. I'm not talking about what we can bring about. I'm talking about a fountain. I'm talking about a source, a source that is beyond us, a source that comes from all of eternity, a source that comes from God, that is God himself. It's timeless. I'm talking about a fountain, a torrent that puts to shame a torrent that puts to shame the rivers that are rushing with snow melt. In fact, Jesus, Jesus said it this way. On the last day of the great feast, this was the Feast of Tabernacles, um, Jesus cried out and he said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living waters. And that's what it's torrents. Out of his, out of his heart is going to flow, is going to gush forth these torrents of living water. This is just the promise of God. He's not saying, well, perhaps. Perhaps if you come to me, this might happen to you. He's not being passive about this stuff. He's saying, look, you come to me. When you come to me and you drink, this is what's going to be going down in your life. This stuff is going to be coming out, these torrents of living water. Now, John knows that we need some clarification on it. So in the very next verse, he tells us, in case we don't understand what he's talking about, he said he spoke this. Jesus spoke this concerning the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been Glorified. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Torrents of living water. And John clarifies and said, look, this is, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Indwelling people. He said, but they couldn't receive it yet because he hadn't been glorified. He hadn't gone to the cross yet. He hadn't risen from the dead yet. You see, sin has to be put away in order for God to enter into these lives. God could be with you. The Holy Spirit could be with you. But in order for him to indwell us and have these torrents, sin has to be put away. And so he said, John says, look, they didn't get it yet. Is he was coming because Jesus had not gone to the cross. He had not been glorified yet. He had not gone to the cross, paid the price of sin, risen from the dead, conquering it, and setting people free. Had not happened yet, okay? But living water, torrents of living water, synonymous with the Holy Spirit. Living water. Living water in the first century was fresh water. That's, that's what it was. Um, in desert regions, as you can imagine, as even around here, water is important. We're just way used to clean water here. We just take it for granted. Turn on spigot. There's water coming out. A lot of most places in the world, they don't have that. A lot of places in the world, I mean, they are drinking brackish, filthy, nasty water. They know all about what living water is. They, they, they know about that. When we punch holes in Malawi and Mozambique or drill wells 
in in those nations and that well goes the truck drills that well down they hit water water starts gushing out there is massive celebrations that go on in the villages massive i mean well 85 percent of the world's diseases are waterborne i don't know if you know that or not you get clean water and good sanitation 85 percent of the diseases in the world will be eliminated it's pretty crazy, okay? But anyway, so when, when fresh water is hit, living water is hit, when that starts gushing out, people start shouting. You can't keep those people quiet. They are just like rejoicing. The old women, they start dancing up a storm. I mean, these old, they seem like they were sort of crippled old ladies all of a sudden are dancing on their, on their feet. There is dancing, there is singing, there is praising. It is like an unbelievable time. Unbelievable. You couldn't stop the joy that's going on. Living water, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. If people do that with water that's coming out of the ground, that's bubbling forth from the ground, you know, like, what in the world should be going on with the believer where the Holy Spirit is indwelling them? And he's having his way in them. Well, John, Jesus said in John 14, Another spot where he talked about living water, he was talking to a woman and he said, whoever drinks this water in, in this well, look, um, or, or sorry, whoever drinks the water that I shall give, speaking of the Holy Spirit, will never thirst, but the water I shall give shall become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Springing up, welling up to ever, everlasting life. You ever, um, you know, when you fill up a bottle in, in a, in the faucet, it makes that sound when it's filling up, the right? <laughs> so you say, like, it's what's going to be happening in your, in your life, and there should be this filling up, this, this overflowing, it's, it's an everlasting life thing going on. Now, listen, we can turn it off. We can turn off this fountain. We can turn off this geyser. We can cap the geyser. So now that, that, that joy is not going to flow out of my life. I'm so, torrents aren't going to flow out of my inmost being. Just turn, just turn off the faucet. How do, how do we do that? There's lots of ways to do that. One of the ways, one of the quickest ways to do that in our lives, turn off that faucet of joy in our lives, is just don't be current with Jesus. Just, you know, run off of yesterday's momentum. Lots of Christians do that. Like, they had a time when they were on fire for the Lord. They had a time when they were seeking the Lord's face. They had a time, you know, when I was really close, and I hungered and thirsted for after Jesus. And it was an awesome time, and it filled me up. And you know what you could do with that? You just run with it. You just run with it. You could run off of that momentum for a long time. Some Christians do it for years. 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 But what happens in that person's life is... When they're running off of yesterday's momentum, well, you know, there's no current wow gods in my life. There's no praise Jesus, is thank you Jesus in my life. It's just this conservative type of attitude that's going in my life where I know how to behave properly. Look, I've been a Christian for over, over 20, 20 years. I mean, I, I know a lot of the church culture. You know, you pick up on a lot of that stuff on how to, how to behave properly, how to say the right things, how to pull it off being a Christian. Is that what you want? Is that what Jesus came to die and rose again for us so that we could just like put on some kind of show? It's kind of like a steam locomotive. The old steam locomotives used to fill up with the, with the coal and they build up that big head of steam and they get that locomotive running down the tracks. You could run that locomotive for a long time without ever throwing any more coal in it. Got a big old head of steam behind it when it's flat. But once it starts hitting a hill, once it hits a bump in the road or, you know, uh, you know trial, tribulation, say, for, for, for our lives in that kind of respect, it can't, it's not going anywhere any further. You go, well, what happened? Well, way back there, you stopped feeding the fire. If you would have just fed the fire, it would have just continued to build up that steam. It would have continued to build up those torrents. They would have continued to flow. And that's, and that's the way it is. We could turn off the faucet. This is why Jesus warned us about, like, when the word goes out, we have to be careful. That the word falls on different soils. Those soils are our hearts. And that, in that soil, we can have a hardened heart. We can have a, a heart that's all distracted. Or he said like this in Matthew or Mark chapter 4. He said this. There's another soil. It's, it's the um, one of thorns. 
And they're the ones that hear the word, the word of God, and the cares of this world. Got any cares of this world? He said, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, always trying to get ahead, the desire for other things, they enter it and it choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Weighed down by the cares of this world. Peter knows about that. That's why he told us very emphatically. He said, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Don't think he doesn't know you. Don't think he doesn't care for you. He knows exactly what you're going through. He says, this is what you need to do, though. You don't want to turn off the faucet. In order to not turn off the faucet, this is the option. I cast my cares upon him. Now, now we, we have the option. We have the choice. So we could say, no... I just don't have the time to do that right now. That's a choice. That's, that's an option. We could say, well, I just don't feel like it right now. That's an option. That's, that's a choice. That's, that's a choice. It's an option. You could choose that thing. You, you could say, well, you know, I've tried it before in the past, but I just don't know how. Again, that's our option. We could hide behind. We could hide behind our laziness. We could hide behind our indifference, hide behind our apathy. We could hide behind our own lies. God is not going to force us to have torrents of living water gushing out of our inmost being. He's not going to force us to have the joy of his, the joy of the Holy Spirit gushing out, overwhelming, overflowing in these lives. He's not going to force us to. This is where we are today in, in the passage where Jesus takes these 70 disciples who had just gone out and they're, they're coming back and they're, and they're full of joy. And it's, it's not that their eyesight's way off in this part. This is part of the journey here. And this part of the journey is just a little bit fuzzy. I mean, it's not like, let's call it a fire down from heaven and wipe out entire villages of women, children, cats, and dogs, and all that kind of thing. This was just like, we're just not seeing quite clearly. And so he comes in and he just, you know, dials in their vision just a little bit. So verse 10, seven, or chapter 10, verse 17, the 70 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. It's a great thing. They're full of joy. The 70 disciples, we met them last week. If you weren't here, you could pick up a CD or download it. Actually, we have it on YouTube now as well. Um, 70 were sent out two by two to go out into the various cities and the towns that Jesus was going to go to. And we should all be able to relate to the 70. Not that we can't relate to the 12. We should be able to relate to the 12, too. I mean, we've been seeing as we've been going through. I mean, they were a bunch. A lot of times they were just bozos like us. They didn't see things clearly. It didn't stop Jesus from using them. But sometimes people, well, there's a lot of tradition. You know, from the 12 to where we are now, there's a lot of tradition that's crept in, and people just see them with halos over their heads, and they can't relate to them. Well, we can all relate to the 70. These people were just kind of following Jesus when they could. You know, they weren't with him all the time, but they did when they could. And they were sent out by Jesus, and they were used powerfully for his kingdom. Well, what allowed them to be used for his kingdom? I mean, what was it? I mean, was it because, you know... The, you know, some kind of glow came upon them? I mean, was it, was it because of the way Jesus prayed for them? I mean, what was it that allowed them to be used for God's kingdom the way that they were used? Really, it was like two things. I mean, well, they were followed. They were his, right? I mean, that's obvious. That's an obvious thing. But the first thing was just their willingness. They were willing to go. Second thing is they were just available. Willing and availability go a long, long ways. Sometimes we're just not willing. And so we don't see God's hand in our lives. We're not overflowing with joy because we're just not willing, God. I don't, you know, show me what you might have and I'll see if I like it or not. If I don't like it, you know, because I don't like peas, you know, maybe I don't like what it is that you're going to ask me to do. This is a lot of times we're just not willing. Sometimes we're just not available. We've got such a cram-packed schedule. We're not going to stop and say to God, well, you know what, God, interrupt my life. God, I'm willing to be used by you, and, you know, praying in the morning. God, I'm willing to be used by you, but like, um, see if you can find a slot. I've got a slot right there, 9.15 to 9.35. God, right there, you can, you can fit, if you want to fit me in there, I'll, I'll be used by you there. Willing and available. God's not going to force us to be willing or to be available. Um, that ball is in our court. That's our choice, completely. 
The 70 were both willing and available, and they were used by God in powerful ways. They come back, and they are filled, overflowing with joy. Why? Success. <laughs> it was great. I mean, look at what happened. Things turned out wonderfully. Of course it was. Of course we're full of joy. Wow, God, you know, God did great things. And listen, that's a great reason for joy. We should celebrate success. I mean, that's a great thing to do, right? I mean, when you're used by God and you see the eternal break, break out into the temporal, there's reason for joy, okay? When you go out in Jesus' name and you see success, it's a beautiful thing. You know, woo-wee, you know, let's praise God for it. It's awesome. The demons flew when we went out in your name, Jesus. A lot of joy there. Joy of being used by God. Joy of, man, joy of, like, of like teaching the kids, and when the kids grab on, they got it. Uh, there should be celebration there, right? The joy of, of you know, sharing the gospel, sharing the way to be made right with God, and somebody's understanding was opened. There should be celebration there. The joy of being able to share your testimony and you get to see in that person how the Holy Spirit is grabbing onto their hearts and ministering to them. There should be a lot of joy there. Oh, good. Good reason for joy. Good reason to celebrate. Jesus is doing it. Jesus is doing work. But Jesus doesn't leave them at that. See, what he does is he comes in, he kind of tunes in their sight a little bit. I want you to be a little bit more accurate on this. I want you to see a little bit more clearly on this. Great to celebrate. There's no doubt about it. Great to have joy in those things. Great. But let's move on. He's going to show us the real reason for it. Well, he's first going to see a couple of verses. He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now, theologians have been um, debating exactly what this verse means for generations. Um, and there's about three different ways you can look at it. They all are virtually the same. Um, first off is that Jesus saw Satan fall from, from heaven, you know, like, like lightning. And that is in, in time past before Adam and Eve fell. Jesus was there and he saw Satan fall. Um, and indeed he did and he, he was there because Jesus is from, Jesus is from um, eternity past. He is God. He has always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are three and yet one. We call that the Trinity or the triune nature of God. God always has been. God created all things. Occasionally you'll meet somebody and they'll go, well, if God created all things, then who created God? What's the wrong question? You're, you know, God created time, space, mass, continuum. He created that. Now, you're asking a question that puts him within his creation. I just got done telling you is he's outside of his creation. We don't understand that. It's beyond our, under our scope. We can't think outside of linear um, time. But anyway, the angels were created. Satan was originally an angel. Um, there wasn't always evil. Satan was originally an angel. And we are told, we, we don't know exactly when, but Satan fell because he was full of pride. And that, that pride was so contagious, so infectious, that a third of the angels fell along with him. A third of them went in that rebellion. So it could be what Jesus is referring to. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Very quick, sudden fall. It was done. Sin separates us from God. Suddenly. It doesn't, it's not like this period of time. It's a sudden thing. Sin has to be taken care of. It separated um, Satan from God. Second thing is some people say, well, you know, Jesus is speaking more in the lines of figuratives here of where the 70 went out and as they went out and they're preaching about the kingdom of God, people were receiving the kingdom or they're entering into the kingdom of God. And so Satan's power was being pushed back. It's being broken as people are entering into the kingdom. And that's, that's an awesome thing there as well. Um, third possibility is Jesus was saying this to warn the guys. So, you know, I was there when Satan fell. I saw what was going on in his heart. His heart was filled with pride, so don't you get filled with pride either. You're being used by God. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing to rejoice in, but don't forget the reason why you rejoice. It's because God's doing the work in you. Don't get so stuck on your achievements or your successes that they become more valuable to you than Jesus. 
See, so it's great to celebrate victories, but we always celebrate them in view of the victor. Always. Verse 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, that's quite a promise. Here's the question. Was Jesus promising this in regards to physical protection? Go wherever it is that I am sending you. Just go out there. And as long as you are in my will, you are going to be perfectly physically protected. Is that what he's promising them? So if you get injured, if you get killed, if you get bit by a snake or a scorpion or anything along that line, then, then that's going to be your measurement. It must have been out of God's will. Some Christians, that's the way that they see it. Actually, a lot of Christians think along this line. They'll say things along this line. Well, isn't it great to be in God's will when everything's going smooth? Well, what does it mean when things aren't going smooth in my life? Does that mean I'm out of his will? I mean, what's the deal? So many Christians think that. They think, look, if I'm walking in Jesus' will, I'm going to have like this protective bubble around me, and I'm just, wherever I go, I'm just kind of going to be protected by God the whole time. Nothing, no harm's going to happen to me at all. But that bubble gets popped quick. Especially if you're not from the West where there's a lot of insulation. Believers all around the world right now are dying, die physically from snake bites, scorpion bites, Believers all around the world right now have nasty things happening to them physically. I mean, look at Egypt, look at, look at Iraq, look at Iran and what's going on with the Christians in, in these nations. Look at Saudi Arabia, look at Israel, look at, look at what's going on in Syria and Afghanistan and the, the way that the church is getting hunted down and believers are being persecuted. And I mean, that's just a small bite of it. You could keep on going to India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. You could go over into you know, the, the Nepal and down Pakistan. So we could just keep on going on and on and on. Christians all, our brothers and sisters all around the world right now, um, many places being persecuted because of their faith. Many, many Christians have been tortured. Many Christians have been driven out of their homes, have their homes burned down, have been killed. Others, others still have been imprisoned all because of their belief in Jesus. Pastor Sahid still in prison in Iran who's tortured in prison, has internal bleeding going on, can't get any medication, they won't give him any, he was up for another operation, they refused to operate again on him. Why? Because he's in God's will. He's in God's will. James, one of the three inner circle, right, of, of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, closest to Jesus, went with them everywhere. So first one to be killed for his faith. Of, of the apostles, beheaded by Herod in there. Was it because he was out of God's will? No, Peter got out. Peter got out of that jail. They were going to kill him too, but he got out of that jail that night. Was it Peter more in God's will than it was James? Or is James' time just stop? Well, I was um, once traveling through no man's land between Malawi and Mozambique, no Man's Land is, is a UN buffer zone where there's not supposed to be any war. They made it. Um, no country owns it. It's like a war-free zone, supposed to be like that. Um, well, for us, it's we have to get through one border and get to the other border before the other border, border closes. And we were getting there. It was like right towards dusk. And we had to hit the Malawi border, get across before sunset because it closes. And if it closes, then you're stuck in No Man's Land in this UN buffer zone, which is really people who are in trouble go there, right? Because there's like no law there. And so like we want to get there. So we're racing through this dirt road, you know, cruising through no man's land. I think it was a seven mile or 13 mile stretch somewhere along that line. And my friend Mateo is driving at the time. And all of a sudden these guys jump out of the bushes with machine guns in front of our car up ahead of us. Mateo turns to me and says, what do you want me to do? <laughs> And I'm looking at him going like, well, there's five of them. If there was one, I know what you'd do. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but there's five of them. And so, you know, we stop because that's the only thing you can do. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that run through your mind at that time as you're weighing through the options. Um, so we stop, and the guys fan around the truck. Wait, I, you know, 
machine guns just make me uneasy. I don't care what country I'm in. When somebody breaks out a machine gun, guys are in special forces and police, that's, uh, you know, I'm still not comfortable around them. But, you know, they just make me uncomfortable. And here they were fanning around their truck, and it turns out they just want a ride. So, like, what are we going to do? <laughs> of course you can have a ride. Now, did, now, did that, because it turned out okay, did that mean we were in God's will? Suppose it didn't turn out that way. Suppose everybody got killed. Would that mean we were out of God's will? We we're in Malawi. There's a lot of stories, I guess, that, that could come from there. But um, I've killed two black mambas there. Well, one I think was a cobra, actually. I think that was the last time. Um, but one black mamba I didn't mean to kill. I just didn't know it was a black mamba. I thought it was a log in a row, and I didn't have time to swerve out of the way. It was nighttime, so we ran right. Oh, it was massive. It was a massive thing. It was covering the road. And so um, I was going to actually back up, and my friend said, you've got to roll up your window because they jump. Well, you were there. Were you there in that one? You weren't there in that one. But we had people in the back of the truck. I'm like, okay, I think we'll just go forward instead because they rise up three feet in the air, and they move at 30 miles an hour, three feet in the air. Um, very deadly safe. Killed a gray scorpion. Gray scorpion, their, um, their English translation is man killer um, for them. Um, is that what Jesus is talking about? Trampling on scorpions and snakes? Is that is protecting, trampling on them? Is that, the talking, is that what he was talking about protection-wise? No. No, no, I do praise God for his protection. I do, I do praise that. I rejoice in those things. I, I love when that stuff happens when I'm on the other side of it. I like that. I like that. Going through it, sometimes I don't like it so much, but he never promised us, never promised us that we would be free from physical harm. He never promised us that we would be free from physical damage happening to us. In fact, Paul kind of tells us the exact opposite. In Romans chapter 8, he says this. He says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? But there's the ultimate question. What's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword? None of those things sound nice, do they? Anybody stand in any of those lines? Distress here? Anybody want more distress, more persecution? No, he says this, for your sake we're killed all day long and we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. He says, but this is, this is what happens to us because of your name, because of your will. I'm available, I'm willing. I, I don't care if it brings me through all these things that are, can harm me physically. In fact, he goes on further, and he says, yet yeah, in all these things, I, all these things that go down in our lives, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor created thing, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Like the physical stuff's going to go down. Life is not safe. But there's one thing that can never be separated, and that is nothing can separate the child of God from God's love in Jesus Christ. Nothing can do it. If you've been made a child of God, nothing, can, well, Jesus said it this way in John John chapter 10, verse 28, he said, I give them eternal life. This is a great gift. I, I give, give them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus tells us, I have you in the palm of my hand. Nothing is uh, going to snatch you out of my hand. Nothing, nothing. So trampling, snakes, scorpions. In the verse, Jesus links it with trampling the powers of darkness. Powers of darkness, powers of the enemy. So let's dial this in a little bit. Whenever we carry the gospel, that is the way that a person can be made right with God by having their sins removed, be brought into a right relationship with Jesus, right? So whenever a person carries that message of the gospel... Whenever the hungry get 
fed, whenever the naked get clothed, whenever the orphan, the widow, the, the alien, the, the poor, whenever, whenever they are taken care of, whenever the person is visited in prison in Jesus' name, we're trampling on the powers of darkness, trampling on them. Every day, this, this church feeds um, over 200 people, mainly orphans in Malawi and Mozambique. Every day, twice a day, over 200 people are getting fed Malawi and Mozambique. Every day, the powers of darkness are getting trampled on. Every, every time you leave these doors holding on to the word of God that's been given, every time you do that, the powers of darkness are getting trampled on. Every time you support a missionary, every time you pray for one another, every time you pray for God's kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, the powers of darkness are getting trampled on every single time. Physical protection, eternal the eternal will never be harmed. Jesus said, don't worry about your life. I know what you need. I know how to get you home safe. Don't worry about your life. In the Psalms, it tells us that God knows the number of our days. Before any one of our days were even written, God already had the number of them stored for us. We don't know how many they are. We don't. You cannot walk in God's will, I don't care what, how radical it is or, or how he's asking you to step out or how you might be thinking he's asking you to step out. You cannot step out in it and have one day cut short. Doesn't matter how hairy it looks. Doesn't matter. Now, it doesn't mean that we tempt God. Doesn't mean like we bring a whole bunch of snakes up front and scorpions up front and, and do that kind of thing. Um, but we're very free. Very free in Jesus Christ. So dialing, dialing this in, let's move on. Verse 20. Okay, so here's, here's where we go with the rejoicing. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you. Pretty good thing to celebrate, though. But don't rejoice in this, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Jesus says, look, look, this is what you need, guys. Let's dial it in here with your vision. It's a little blurry here. I'm going to dial it in for you. Here's the thing you need to rejoice in. Here's the thing, that your names are written in heaven. When you start understanding this, when you start doing this, it's like uncapping that geyser. It's like, it's like turning back on the faucet. Okay, your joy starts overflowing because, you know, joy from circumstances, I mean, it's wonderful. Joy from victories, joy from successes, joy from warm temperatures outside, things thawing. I mean, that's all wonderful stuff. But all of those things are terminal. All of them. Circumstances change. Victories and successes um, don't always remain. Warm temperatures well, I think we're supposed to get a cold spurt again, right? I, it's, it's like an happen, right? I mean, winter comes around on a regular basis, right? I mean, it's like it, it happens. And I'm not trying to poo-poo joy or anything like that. Um, it's great. Great to celebrate the things that God does in our lives and through our lives. Great to celebrate what God's doing in other people's lives. It's great to celebrate that. Um, it's great to, when we gather together. I mean, we gather together. That's what we're doing. We are celebrating, right? We come, we sing songs of worship. We, we should be celebrating in the midst of it, celebrating the life that we have in Christ, celebrating what God has done in our lives and what he's doing among us. You know, when we're listening to the word of God, there should be celebration going on. There should be joy rising up in our hearts. So when we're hearing God's word going forth, because it's like, Wow, I, I get it. He's, he's, I'm grabbing on to some of this stuff I've never grabbed on to before. It should be rising up within us. It should be, we should be you know, acknowledging that. It's a wonderful thing. Celebration's great. But here's something to celebrate that is to become the fountain of all celebrations. Your name has been written in heaven. Your name. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you trust in him, if you trust in him, your name has been written in heaven. And it's not going to change. It's been written there. It's great to recognize the authority over demons. 70, we're celebrating that. It's great to recognize and rejoice in successes. It's great, great things there. 
but it never compares to that which can never be taken away and never be changed. It's eternal life. So let's just dial this in a little bit on um, joy, tuning in our joy. First thing first here, the fountainhead of all joy, fountainhead of it, is that my name is written in heaven. It's an awesome thing to be able to say, I'm saved. I'm saved. Did you ever just say that? Like, I'm saved. I've been (laughs) rescued. I have been rescued. I know where he grabbed me from. I have been rescued. He has given me life. And so my name's written in heaven, and here's the thing. We need to rejoice in that. We, we need to rejoice in that. So it's an awesome, amazing, amazing thing. Um, rejoicing, my name's been written in heaven. Um, it's good to stop from time to time. Prayer life, sometimes get busy, it could be full of, I've got all these requests to make. It's good to just stop time to time and just go, thank you, Jesus. I am saved. And just like meditate on that for a little bit. Just like think about that. Fill your mind with those thoughts and what that means. Tell you why it's going to start. It's just going to start is feel joy, start welling up within you, and it will break forth in praise. You won't be able to keep your mouth silent. You won't be able to keep proper conservative, okay? So it's good to stop and to praise. Thank Jesus for the work that he's done on our behalf. Thank Jesus for purchasing me. Thank you. I was talking to this guy once, oh, it's, it's a few years back, I, I, maybe even many years back at this point in time, but just, just met the guy, just met the guy, just kind of got introduced, and the guy asked me, first thing he says to me, he says, what's the deal with the book of life thing? And how do you get your name written in it? I'm like, okay, <laughs> sure, it was good to meet you. Let's, see, let's get right into it. Um, and, it's, and it's great, you know, I was talking to him about that, about Jesus' crucifixion, explained to him about how Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead three days later, how sin has separated us from God, and that, like, that's our deal. We've been separated from God, but that's why Jesus died on the cross. He paid the price, the penalty of our sin, that whoever believes and trusts in him, their name gets written there, written in heaven. It's free. So many Christians anxious about their salvation, anxious about their eternal destiny. Some are apathetic, but that's a whole different subject. But others are anxious. And many question, you know, am I really in? Am I really saved? Am I not in? Did I do it right? Did I do this? I remember as a kid being in that place, and I used to just constantly be praying every night, the sinner's prayer. Lord Jesus, you know, I'm sorry of my sin, and please forgive me of my sin, and come into my heart afresh, or, or, or along those lines. Sinner's prayer is a wonderful thing. It's not in the Bible, but it's, it's a wonderful thing. Believing in Jesus, professing Jesus, con- repenting of sin, asking him into our lives. It's a beautiful thing. But I remember as a kid just doing that all the time, oh, just insecure a- about the whole thing, wondering if I was in or not. And, w- and what, happens, what happens is when you're living in that place of uncertainty, It's just a cap on that joy that God wants to release in our lives. It's a cap. You know, it's just, it's keeping us from rejoicing and releasing what the Holy Spirit wants to do in, in, our, in our lives. This is why, guys, this is why we give an opportunity after every service for people to come forward and to receive prayer, right? And we say, look, if you haven't received Jesus, come forward, and there's elders and worship teams available, and they're going to pray for you, right? A couple of people are going to be praying for you. Why? Well, out of the mouth of two or three witnessing, witnesses, a thing is, 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 um, is, is there. There, right? It's, it's for me, it's sure. Um, but as well, it's so that the person who's coming to ask for prayer, they're hearing themselves profess Jesus Christ. They're hearing themselves speak of what's already in their heart. And then as the other people are praying with them and, and praying the same thing with them, the people that are praying with them could say to them, you know what, because of your confession, because of what you've said with your mouth, God's word, the authority of God's word, that does not change. God's word is not going to change. Your emotions are. But because of what you've said, God's word says you're saved. Your name is written in heaven. It's a done deal. And sometimes, sometimes we just need to hear that from somebody else. We hear from, we, we, we understand it's right there in God's word, but we don't know if we did it right. And so when you have some people who are praying with you, they can just say, it's a done deal. You go, I'm going, yeah, all right. 
source of joy. Don't blow it off in uncertainty, though. Don't do that. Or if you've never come to Jesus to begin a relationship with him, don't just blow it off when you have an opportunity to secure it for yourself. Because that's why we're here for one another. Jesus offers out freely his gift of life. Freely. We just have to receive it. So I'm getting ahead of myself because I was getting on to the next point. But why is this joy of, of our name being written in heaven so important? Um, because you know what? It doesn't matter what happens to me here on earth. The best is still to come. It just doesn't matter. I mean, life can be good. You'd be in a spot where you're just going, Psh, I'm wearing a t-shirt. I got the hat. You know, life is good. I got the sticker on my car. Life is good. You know what? That's great. The best is still to come. You might be in a spot where you go, you know what? It's pretty lousy right now for me. It's pretty lousy. But it still doesn't knock the joy out of me. Why? Because I know what's coming can never be compared with what's happening right now. You see, when this is happening in me, when I start grabbing onto this, when I recognize this, it helps me to enjoy. It helps me to experience. It helps me to put a handle on life right now and to, and to go through it without any fear. Because nothing can be taken from me that's been given to me. Nothing. The most important can never be touched. It's secure for me in heaven. It's never going to change. The best is yet to come. And so do this. Rejoice that your name's been written in heaven. And if it hasn't, then get it there. Okay, so this is so. Let's talk about how to get it there. Verse twenty-one. And Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, "I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. So it seemed good in your sight." Jesus is rejoicing in the spirit. He's rejoicing in the spirit, saying, "God, thank you. Why? Because you've hidden it from." the wise and the prudent, but you've revealed it to the babes, the children. God is really, 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 we throw enough of those in, really not into people looking down on other people. Really not into it. He is really, really not into the whole competitive things that can go on in our lives and can happen in church and, and so forth like that. Um, really not into it. Really not into people that think they're very sophisticated or more cultured than other. I mean, you could choose those things. You could choose, you could choose to be the competitive thing. You could choose to be sophisticated culture and all that more than other people. You could choose to look down your nose at, at other people. You could choose to judge people and, and, and all of that. But understand, when you choose that, you, you, you choose that, you're choosing to be the wise and the prudent one. Scripture tells us that that's pride. That's pride. And Pride, well, God opposes the proud. So we could choose that path, but then we also have to know something that God's opposed to us. That's our choice. Or we could be humble, go through times of being humbled as well, um, and God gives grace to them. So our choice, we, we have a choice there. I've talked with people before, I'm sure you have as well, and they speak to you in a condescending tone, you know, when they find out you're a Christian, and they kind of look down their nose at you, and they, and they start talking to you as if you're a poor, uneducated person who, who needs God, you know, and all this, and who interprets the Bible literally under their definition of what literal is, of course. Um, those folks have always been around. Every generation's had them. Jesus rejoices. I rejoice, Father, that you hid your fountain of joy. I rejoice that you've hid the source of life. I rejoice that you've hid eternal life from them. But you've revealed it to babes. Your choice, my choice, pride or humility, it's our choice. Failure never keeps you away from God. Failing never does. Pride does. Failing draws us closer to God a lot of times because we're in a place of brokenness and we're seeing our own garbage and we need help. Babes are simply people, children, children. Um, they're people that humble themselves before God and admit that they need him. 
That's what a babe is. Um, so the accessibility of this salvation that Jesus is talking about is made to all, but in order for one to receive it, they have to come as a child. A child. A child, you think about a child. When a child comes up, a child doesn't have anything to offer. They don't bring something to the table with them. They just come with open hands to receive. He says, that's the way you need to come. So the re reason for rejoicing, going back into that and tuning this, this in, is salvation's free. It's a free gift, accessible to all. The humble are going to receive it. The child is going to receive it. Okay, If I'm full of pride, I'm not going to, and I'm not going to see it as free. I'm going to try to earn it. But I'm not going to earn salvation. It is a gift that's only received. And so here, it's never been dependent upon me, and it never will be. It's dependent upon him and his work. Let's move on. Jesus said in verse 22, he said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Jesus reveals the Father. He's the one that does it. You know, Jesus told us that anyone who comes to him, he will not cast out. Sometimes a person is understanding they're missing it. They're not getting it. I was in that place where I just, I didn't get it. I, I, I missed it. And you know what I did? I asked him for it. I asked him for revelation. I asked him to reveal himself to me. I asked him to penetrate my heart. We can ask him. Jesus said this, John 14, 1. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't apologize to him for that. So this is just the way of it. I'm the way to the Father. No, you can't get to the Father any other way. I'm the one who reveals the Father to you. It doesn't happen another way. And how do we come to the Father? Well, we come through Jesus Christ, and we come, through, we come in belief. We come in trusting him. Now, now, belief is an interesting term because we've redefined belief in our day and age, our, our culture. When we say, I believe in something, it doesn't necessarily mean it the way the Scripture does. It just means I acknowledge some facts. So you can say, I believe in God, just as well as you can say, I believe there's cars in a parking lot. It's like, well, that's great, you know? But, but so what? It, hasn't all, it doesn't do anything to the core of my being. Belief in the Bible is a trusting and relying upon God, upon Jesus. So it's believing, it's trusting in Jesus. It alters my way of life. It alters my outlook. It alters my mode of operation, how I go about things. Jesus is the one who reveals the Father. He's the one who is the way to the Father. It is through belief in him and trusting in him that one receives this gift of salvation to themselves. Gift. Verse 23. So he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are your eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, but have not heard it. The 70 got to see something that many of the Old Testament prophets and Old Testament kings long to see. That is the Messiah walking on earth. Over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to the time when the Messiah would walk on earth. And those prophets were looking at the scriptures and studying the scriptures saying, when is it going to be? And here's the 70. They got to see it. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. But you know what? The 70 didn't get to see the whole picture. I mean, they did later on. They did see Jesus go to the cross, many of them. Many of them saw Jesus rise from the dead three days later. Forty days after that, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sits until the day that he returns. And he will return one day. Prophets and the kings longed to see that day when salvation would be provided. But you know another day that they longed to see? This is the day that he would return. You know what? We don't know when Jesus is going to return. We don't know. But we are closer now than we've ever been. And you know what? All those prophets, those Old Testaments, those people, even the New Testament ones, they look forward to this day, right now, that we're living in. Do you know why? Because not only do we know about the complete work that Jesus did on the cross and from rising from the dead, but we also have his word. We have his word, and we have the Holy Spirit. You see, 
the disciples, I mean, they got, to, they got to see this stuff go down. And sometimes we could look at them and go, oh, what it would have been like to just live in that day when, you know, Jesus was walking on the earth and to see these things go down. But, you know, they look at us and go, they would look at us and go like, wow, you have the word of God complete right there available to you. And you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the Word of God and the, and the Holy Spirit are teaching you, they're training you, they're instructing you, they're showing you the way to walk. They're teaching you, you know, like the Scripture says in, in um, 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, for the Word of God, for all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed and it's profitable. Listen, listen. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God's doing that. The Word of God is equipping us for every good work. The Word of God is training us, it's teaching us, it's growing us up. It's teaching us the things about, about, about God. It's teaching us about the heart of God. It's teaching us the ways of God. And the Holy Spirit's working along with the Word. It reveals the deepest things. Even within us. I mean, we're in the word and what happens to us? Man, it starts revealing things that are hidden. Stuff that we thought maybe we were over and we're not over. It's bringing it up. You know, things that we thought were, you know, we, we, we had hidden, hidden motives, you know, hidden pains, hidden crooked ways. The word of God starts showing us them for the reason to bring us to the cross and to the empty tomb where we could find power to overcome them. You know, there's power in the resurrection. It's power in the Word. But you know what? It takes time to be in the Word. I can't just sleep on it at night and just like hope that osmosis is going to work. It's just somehow going to penetrate through my brain. It's not going to happen. It takes time to be in His Word, to open up His Word and to sit and to be still before God and to go, all right, God, I don't understand it. A lot of times it goes in one ear, out the other, but I want to understand you. And to be still. I say, I'm, I'm ears. God, I'm going to read something. And I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask you, what does that mean? But I want you to speak to me. It takes time to do that. But blessed are we when we take time and we invest in that which never fades away. It becomes, what happens is, it becomes an unstoppable, unquenchable geyser that starts flowing up from within us. So going back to our tuning in joy. And so here's our, here's our last thing is God has made his word available to us. And man, it should bring us great joy that we can understand God's heart, that we can understand God's ways. God longs for his Holy Spirit and longs for his joy to overflow in our lives. C.S. Lewis called joy the serious business of heaven. That's a good quote. The serious business of heaven. May we be caught up in the serious business of heaven. Jesus shows us the way. The question is, it just comes down to, it's like, we just walk in his way. He showed it. Have your name written in heaven. Rejoice in it. It's the way to have this overflowing joy. Understand that salvation is free. It's a free gift. The only thing you have to do is like with any kind of gift, you just take it to yourself, receive it. It's free. There should be rejoicing in it. I can't add to it. I can't take away from it. And God's made his word available. I'm going to tune in our joy. It would be people that are overflowing with it. Let's pray. So Lord God, we do thank you. Thank you for your word. We thank you for being able to study it and just sit underneath the teaching of it. Have your way in us, Lord God. Have your way. Lord, we long for all that you have for us. Um, help us to keep from sabotaging ourselves from it. Teach us by your spirit, Lord. Um, may we not let your word go in one ear and out the other. May we hold on to it as we head out these doors. Lord, may we see um, the powers of darkness just trampled underfoot. Use us, Lord. We want to be available to you completely. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.